Once you uh, got together, I, th I think it was you who kind of said, "Well, I don't want to just play old songs." And no, we all. I mean, we all said okay. that. Yeah. yeah, we all had a chat and decided we were going to make some new music, provided the first few shows went okay. Because at that point, we didn't know if anybody was going to turn up, which is, mm. I guess, why we booked a little kind of warm up in a. 300 capacity club in London okay. and it's sold out in about two minutes <laughs> so we thought okay there's going to be a few people there and then the village underground was 800 and it sold out in an hour so at that point it was like well you know if, if these gigs go well which it looks like they'll be okay then we should definitely uh, definitely start kind of writing when we get a chance but we didn't get a chance for a while did we because suddenly we had about 40 gigs booked yeah, so we ended up doing quite a lot of shows. But I think that was really good for us to kind of get back into being, the, being in the band and sort of, you know, just get some momentum for, uh, you know, before we went into a studio. I think that was quite, quite good for us, you know. And I think the, the record sort of reflects that because it's quite a sort of a band sounding record, you know. It's, it's, it's much different, you know, it's a totally different sort of record to Pygmalion, which was less of a band kind of record, you know. Yeah. I find that very interesting that, that well, you kind of decide to, to get back together and then you find, well, there's a, there's a lot of interest. So, so what does that kind of tell you about your music or what does that do to you that that kind of something you made? Do you think then about what, what your legacy is in the right word, but, but it's kind of... Um, I think that we, you know, I think we were all kind of, I mean, it sounds a bit of a cliche, but I think we were all quite humbled by the fact that people that the music still sort of resonates, you know, and resonates with the, with another generation, basically. So, you know, we're, we're doing gigs to kids who are the same age as us when we were writing the songs, you know, mm. so sort of 17, 18 years old, so. Uh, and it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I, it's certainly something I suppose we'd have never have imagined when we were making those records, so it's, right. it's definitely kind of cool, yeah. And then playing those shows, did you need a bit of a kind of an adjustment period or was it just like the old days from from the start? There was no adjustment period really, was there? We just not really. We just sort of had lots of tea, <laughs> did lots of rehearsing, went for went for lunch together, caught up. Um, yeah, once we'd learnt the relearned the songs, which took a little bit of time and kind of got the right pedals and bought a little bit of equipment. Um, yeah. Yeah. It kind of. I think the first gig was really good, the Hoxton gig, and I don't think there was a dodgy gig where we thought, oh, yeah. we we need to rehearse a lot more. With it, kind of did click pretty pretty much yeah. in that I first mean, rehearsal. It was fun, sort of going out and going pedal shopping, and you know, because the technology's moved on so much exactly. from when we were kids. You know, I think when we started, there was like one reverb pedal, and you know, we all had these. Uh, these Yamaha effects units that had just come out that we thought were like the, you know, the dog's bollocks and that sort of. So I think initially we'd gone, when we were kind of like, well, let's, let's re re do a rehearsal. So we'd all gone and dug out all the old gear. And, but then we realized, well, actually, there's, there's all these kind of bespoke pedal companies now and they make these really cool pedals. So it was, it was impossible not to kind of get excited about checking out all the new stuff. So, so that, that was a really fun part of it. And then, in particular, I, uh, I think then going into the creative process and, like, say, it was more of a collective effort. But, yeah, like you said, there there was technology has uh, had a, had advanced uh, to where yeah. we are now. So, so did that open a whole new playground of, of what you could do? In some ways, it makes things kind of, you know, being able to. I mean, obviously, we've been recording records the last 20 years, so the technology is just something that we're used to. Mm. It's not like we kind of were like, oh, Jesus, you know, <laughs> this is weird. It's no tape machines. Um, but, it, you know, to, to, to make a slow dive record in the same way that I would make a Black Hearted Brother record or the same way that, that Simon would make one of his more sort of abstract ambient records, you know, using a laptop was was a really was a really interesting luxury, I suppose, because it meant that we could go into the studio as a band and jam out ideas. I could take that, work on it on my laptop, edit stuff around, or take it to my studio. And you know, I guess it was much easier to work on stuff when we weren't together. You know, whereas before, I suppose, 
With definitely with, with the first two slow dive albums, it was just a case of going in, putting it to tape, and kind of getting it right, right that way, you know, and sort of not, you don't, I, I like the fact that you can use um, digital technology to edit things and to kind of move things around. I think that's what's really, really brilliant about it, and that's what's really different about tape. Using tape, I still like the way tape sounds. Um, but it's good, I think, if you can use both. Um, and it was something we did with, with Pygmalion. That was the first album where, where we used like, a sequencer and we used a sampler, you know. It was an Atari sequencer and it was you know, a pain in the ass sometimes. But, but the whole record was, was done through sort of creating loops on this, this kind of quite old quite basic computer technology, I suppose, when you look at it now, but it's, right. it's still exactly, you know, it's basic, but it's still, exa it's still kind of the same technology that we use now, but obviously now it's, um, it runs a lot smoother and it's a lot more powerful, but it's, it's essentially the same technology. Yeah. So for the new record, where did you start? Was there a certain song that kind of popped up or was it, was it a, even a, an effect pedal or...? or? yesterday and I couldn't quite remember I, I, I mean it's lots of different ideas wasn't it? I mean we it just was. kind of we we basically just we thought well we'll book a studio and we'll go for a couple of days so we went was it Western Superman was that the first one we it went was to? I think it was which was the first studio we'd done our demo in you know so we just kind of went down there and jammed jammed out for a few days I think I brought in a few ideas yeah. But the whole album was a process, you know, it took uh, two years really to, you know, from the start of sort of 2015 up until November 2017 and so we'd, we'd snatch a few days here and there going to the studio and, and then we'd, we'd work on it ourselves, bring it back to everyone and, and so it was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of moments together, a lot of moments where we're working individually or whatever. You know, and some songs will come just from you working on a new pedal. Right. And I always, I used to love that. That would be how the songs would work. Generally, you know, back in the old days, you'd get a new pedal and be just jamming around with it, and something interesting would happen. You know, it's a lot of accident, I think. That kind of process. Yeah. So, in in terms of the album, was there kind of a turning point then where everything started to? form into an album? Yeah, going back to Courtyard, wasn't it? Yeah. Which was where we recorded the first three albums. Okay. And uh, it belongs to Chris Hufford, who Neil's already mentioned, who, who he doesn't engineer anymore because he manages Radiohead. But he's around, he's kind of upstairs next door and kept popping in and it has the same sofa that we all sat on back in 1991. It's slightly more uncomfortable at this <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah, slightly stiffer and a little bit more worn, but um, that's still there. And it, it, it was kind of like going back to our old sort of spiritual home in a funny kind of way. And at that point, we'd got sort of like a few sort of ideas that we'd fleshed out that were kind of interesting, but we hadn't really got the bulk of the album until we went there. Just loads of ideas and bits and pieces. And that's where it all started to gel. And there was a fantastic engineer in there who sort of allowed Neil to sort of have some space to kind of yeah, grab Ian, ideas. Ian Davenport. Ian Davenport, yeah. Lovely chap. And the rest of us would visit, we kind of, you know, would give Neil a bit of space to kind of work on these ideas, not give him any pressure, pop in, have a listen, play some, you know, play a little bit, maybe suggest this could be like that if, um, if this doesn't work. And, um, you know, we had a few jams in there as well. And Yeah, it came together, though, didn't it? It sort it of it definitely... Like by the end of that session, it was like a two, it was a month, wasn't it? We were there basically. Yeah. And uh, so by the end of that, I think we felt like okay, so we have we have a record that has a shape to it, you know. Mm. So um, yeah, that that was that was the, the turning point, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Did you discuss beforehand kind of what you wanted out of the record, or was that something no. that kind of appeared? No, we didn't talk about it really. I mean, I think we all were like, well, it. I mean, there's, in in so far as we we knew that we wanted it to be something different to what we've done before. We wanted it to be uh, uh, good. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, if it fits those two, we're all right. 
But I think like as it developed, it felt like it had to be familiar to us as well, like it had to be a slow dive record. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous to say it, but there wouldn't be much point in us getting back together to make something that wasn't a slow dive record. But it, you know, it had to be familiar. You know, it wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to be a Simon Scott record. It wasn't going to be a Neil Hauser record or Rachel got, you know, it was going to be a slow dive record. And I think right. it sort of has that. Like to me, there is something really familiar about it in terms of it being a slow dive record, but it's also, you know, it's, it's a different sounding record to what we would have made in the 90s, for sure, you know. Is, it, is there maybe because you mentioned kind of the, the session uh, in the recording studio where it came together, was there maybe a track you remember working on or something that kind of... Uh... Um, that, I mean, it was really fun working on, like, uh, Fallen Ashes there, I mean that, that one really, mm. I think we started that track there because there was a piano in the studio, so that was a really fun one and Simon you threw a lot of your kind of uh, crazy la laptop technology at that one. Yeah that was, it was really nice, I remember getting up and texting Neil I'm going to come in and I turned up and I could hear this beautiful piano, these piano loops and Neil didn't even know I don't think that I was, I kind of opened my bag and just set up my laptop, just use the mic on my on my MacBook just to record like his voice and the piano and put it into some digital signal processing software. It's called Max MSP. And just started to loop him and created all these kind of like sound banks of Neil kind of jamming and um, and I could tell he wasn't quite sure which sort of should the song go this way or that way. And so I just played him those. We put him into the desk and that was really good fun because it kind of happened in the studio and we used the studio as a musical instrument and um, it was kind of an organic sort of unplanned way of yeah. building a song which is actually quite lucid and... Um, it's and an organic yet yeah, abstract kind of approach to making music that, that I think was really good, was a good part, a good thing to do wasn't it at that, yeah. that point? Yeah. yeah, yeah and it's opened a doorway for us to perhaps explore in the near future. Well, one thing about that track that I like is, well, it's, it's, it's with most of your music, and I wonder if you have the same thing, but the, that it conjures up certain Im images. So okay. it, does, does your music for you have a visual aspect as well? No, no, I don't think of it in terms of visually. I think it, I, sometimes I think of tracks in terms of colors, you know, okay. especially when you're, when you're building a track up and I sort of, it has colours, but I, um, but I think it's like it, for us, like it always feels like solo music has to be kind of emotive, you know. So it has to be emotion, have to carry some heavy kind of emotional content for me. Um, and I think that's always like a mix of the melody and the space the track occupies, and sometimes the lyrics are kind of part of that. But it's not, I don't think we ever create tracks that rely on just the lyric to, right. to carry that emotion. I think that it has to be informed by the whole track. You know, I think that's kind of what makes solo music slightly different. And when people say, oh, why do you mix the vocals so low? That's part of the reason, because it's, it's not, you're not getting the lyric, you're not getting the emotional impact from just the vocal and the snare drum, which is what you kind of get with a pop song, you know. Like for us, it has to be a kind of an immersive experience. You know, you can it has, you know, we'd, we'd always mix the vocals low on the early records because if you then played the music really loud, it would make sense. Mm. You know, if you play the music quiet, it doesn't make sense having the vocals really low. Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but so this, this emotive element, is, is that then reflective of what you're going through in the studio at, at that point or, or where, where does it come from? Um, it comes from the music, you know, so it's whatever the music gathers in, that's, yeah, I mean, that's the, like, for me, that's the magic part about making the music, that's the, when we kind of get together, that's, you're like, oh, it's, there's this, you know, there's not five people in the room, there's this other thing, you know, that's happened, you know. Mm. So it's not that you think beforehand, I'd, I'd like to kind of have this certain no. mood or... No, okay. absolutely not. It's, um, you know, we never sit there and think, let's make a, let's make a really sad song, <laughs> yes. oh, you know, or a really happy, happy you know, happy song. It's just kind of, we, you just, it, 
that that comes from us playing together sometimes, you know, and I think those are the really nice moments, you know. I remember like when we the first we did a track called Avalyn on the second second EP and that, that really was a moment when the band kind of coalesced as a sort of a we were like, okay, this is the kind of music we want to make, you know, and it but it wasn't planned, it was just like, oh wow, okay. That sort of happened, you know. But it, so is it's kind of what you're talking about now, is that kind of what you want to do as a band and then even as in, individuals are trying to get out of music, what, why you do it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think like, um, like, well, personally, you know, it's, it's really important to me that I respond to music I listen to emotionally, that it connects on that level. And I, I'm guessing it's like that with everyone, isn't it? That, that yeah, that you kind of, that, that the music resonates with you, like it vibrates in your soul somewhere, and that's, mm. um, yeah, that, that sometimes you don't know why you like something, do you? But it just, it resonates, you know? I think, I think we, we have, um, there's something where Slow Life kind of open a window to the listener, where through that open window they can kind of add their own personal life experiences to what they're listening to, so you know, they'll keep listening to a track off the new album and it could really resonate with something that's happening emotionally with them and they connect that slow dive song to this situation. And we kind of have a lot of people sort of get very emotional at concerts because a particular song, you know, uh, takes them to a period in their life where they were doing something. Maybe that somebody's now not alive or maybe it's a really joyous thing. Or, but yeah, I think we definitely connect on an emotional le level because there's an open space in Slow Dive that lets the listener kind of get immersed in the song and interpret it in their own way. Are we vague? Oh, oh, is we, it because we're really vague? Are we wishy-washy? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, I think We're like an empty box that people can fill up. <laughs> They can chuck with their, their own emotions. Their, their crap in it, yeah. But so so that you don't want to be too direct or concrete about, about I, what I people don't think take we, away I don't think we have a manifesto. It's not like we, we it's not like we're afraid of being direct. Um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, we're not afraid of being direct. I mean, some, some of the, you know, like a track like Dagger is a very sort of direct track, but um, I think that we're not, um, that just because, I think the way we, we like to mix the records kind of allows them to, to not kind of be focused in a way, you know, that, that allows other people to focus themselves, you know, mm. perhaps, I don't know. And very last question then, because, uh, well, you've released three albums uh, a couple of years ago, a, couple, a bunch of years ago. What, what are your hopes for, for Slow Dive now? Um, I think, like, I mean, uh, you know, I think just enjoy the process. You know, it'd be great to make another record. I think we've kind of already got some ideas about, about uh, you know, some avenues that opened up while we were doing this one. Enjoy, you know, it's part of, I suppose, you know, Simon does his own stuff, I do my own stuff, and so do I. It's really nice to go into Slow Dive World and do, do, do that, you know. I, I, I doubt if it'll be something that overtakes everything in everyone's life, but it's nice that it's there as part of our life. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, I hope that we can do something that's sort of creatively fulfilling for us and hopefully something that other people get something out of as well if they listen to it, you know. That's, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.